All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. If you have your Bible, turn with us to Colossians chapter 3. And last week, we sort of covered the first 12 or so verses. We're going to review a little bit of that, and then we'll get into some new stuff tonight. Uh, Scott, can you read chapter 3, verses 1 through 17? Yeah. Colossians 3, starting in verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, for you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you two once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful." Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. You want to open us in prayer, Jerry? Yeah. Gracious Father, what a great joy to uh, uh, feast on your word tonight. Lord, um, Colossians 3, what incredible um, commands and insights just to think today of uh, being wholly chosen and loved by you. Um, it's overwhelming. And so we pray today that we would um, respond to this kind of uh, love with uh, gratitude as we are challenged to do in Colossians 3. Um, and Lord, that we would not only um, understand um, all the indicatives that um, we're, we've started with, but uh, as we're commanded um, as, as husbands, as wives, um, as parents, as children, um, as employers and employees, uh, we pray, Lord, that we would respond well to those as well. So, Lord, we, we ask for your wisdom and humility as we um, think through uh, these tremendous truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Mark, you want to go back to uh, the beginning there for the kind of foundational the, for those first four verses? Yes. Yeah, again, for, for Paul, he always grounds our conduct in who we are in Christ. So Paul cannot talk about conduct without talking about Jesus. He is always intimately tying our behavior to who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for us, just if, if, if you aren't fully sold on that idea, just go through Colossians and look for every reference to one of the persons of the Godhead. And you will find that He, Him, Lord, Christ, Christ Jesus, the Father, the Spirit are in almost every verse. It's everywhere you look some reference to a member of the Trinity. And so Paul can't get far uh, in any direction without referencing God and what He's done for us as a motivator for Christian behavior. And the first four verses clearly unite us with Christ or talk about our union with Christ, and that is, the, that is the spark for all the commands that follow after that. Yeah, I love verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you'll also appear with them in glory. I think it's challenging to think about, can we say that? Is Christ your life? You know, sometimes we see t-shirts that say football is life or, uh, you know, I don't know, um, Chinese checkers is life. Uh, a lot of those around nowadays. You just, but that's for the believer. Oh, motorcycles? Is that Billy? Is that what I was seeing? But Christ is life. And for the believer, that is the bottom line. 
and everything revolves around him. And that's what we're all about. And, uh, and I hope today that you can really say that. Say that sincerely. And if you can't, then kind of go back to the drawing board and say, what is it? What idol is there? Because it is an idol if it's something other than Christ that is truly life for you. And um, I love that statement, verse 4. Scott? Yeah, I mean, I just to piggyback on what Mark said, which we talk about a lot with the Gospel of Central, how it comes first, that grounds the, the, our obedience. Uh, you think of the book of Romans. Uh, I think Sinclair Ferguson has talked about it. Hardly any commands through the first 11 chapters, and then 12, it's just like, boom. He says, like, the floodgates open up. Paul lets them out. But it's, it's the, the, the grounding in, in gospel truth. Uh, that's why I love Jerry Bridges so much. His book, Discipline of Grace, when we went through it with a group of guys, He's probably not the best writer out there, Jerry Bridges, but every, almost every chapter, I think every chapter, he came back and would bring the gospel in because he knows we're so prone to just drift in, like, I got to do this, I got to do this better. And he would, like, he, he would convict you in the chapter, but at the end of the chapter, almost every chapter, I think every chapter, he would bring back gospel truth, which we need again and again, even, especially in this Colossians 3, I'm thinking 18 and following for me this week. I mean, it is convicting. Thinking of husbands, you think all this stuff in, in our work and our jobs. And man, we, we need the gospel so much because we can just think, oh man, I, I'm just, you can beat yourself down, but then come back to the gospel. It's, that, it's the engine. We got to have it. Yeah, I love what you guys brought out last week with the things that we need to put to death. Any more thoughts on um, maybe 5 to 11 there before we get to 12? Yeah, well, I'll jump in at verse 9. <clears throat> Look at verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. And then he says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. So just for a second here, uh, Paul says, in Christ there's neither Jew nor Greek, circumcised or uncircumcised which is two ways of saying the same thing, right? Th th those distinctions are no longer what is important. It's whether you know Christ or not that's the determining factor of whether you're part of His people. But look at verse 12. These three words are used to describe God's people. Put on then as, number one, God's chosen ones, number two, holy, and number three, beloved. So the, the, God's people in Christ are chosen, holy, and loved by God, beloved by God. Chosen, holy, and loved. Now, hold your spot here and go all the way back to Deuteronomy chapter 7 for a second. Deuteronomy chapter 7. This is, some of you have heard this passage before. You've, you've thought about this. The question basically to God is, why did you choose your people? Why did you do that? And his answer is kind of a non-answer that is an answer. So see, see if this makes any sense. Deuteronomy chapter 7, and look at this amazing passage starting in verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. So God's speaking to Israel. Verse 6, for you are a people holy to the Lord, right? We heard holy in Colossians 3. Holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you. So now we see chosen along with holy. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love. Remember the word beloved. So now you've got holy, chosen, and beloved all together in this text. It is not because you are more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. You got chosen again, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt." Now, do, do you hear the answer? Israel, I love you, and I've chosen you because I love you. That's the answer, which sounds like no answer at all, right? I love you, not because you're, the, not because you're more numerous than other peoples. You're actually quite insignificant compared to the Philistines and the, as, whoever else you could pick. No, you're actually not a significant people. I chose you because I love you. Well, wait, why do you love us? Because I chose you because I love you. The, the, the point here is, at, the, at rock bottom, it's nothing in us. It's everything in God's sheer delight that he has chosen Israel and not the Philistines to be his people. He didn't deserve to choose any people group. He chose one out of sheer grace, Abraham and his offspring, and he chose to give blessing. And similarly, we who are in Christ, we are a part of true Israel in Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. He's using Israel language to describe the church in Colossians 3, chosen, holy, and beloved 
not because we're ethnically Jewish necessarily, but because Jesus, the true Israel, we have found ourselves in him, united to Christ. And it proves that God has done this, uh, this sovereign and gracious work to draw us to, to himself. Scott, can you tell us, this? what's your favorite about those three words? I cannot escape those this week. That is just so amazing to be chosen by, the, by God just because he loved you. Uh, to be holy, to be set apart for whatever God has you to do, but to live for his glory rather than to live for your sake, to have that kind of purpose, and then to be loved by him in the way he does. He pursues us with that love. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me or will pursue us all the days of your life. He is after you with that white hot love because he just he chose to love you. And again, I love that, Mark, what you're saying, that there was nothing in us that, and, and man, to start like that makes these imperatives that we're coming to so, so rich. And you want to obey. You want to serve. You want to love him because of that kind of love he's given us, Scott. Yeah, I mean, I just think one commentator said we're privileged beyond all imagination. And I just think if you, as soon as you start to think about it, our adoption or God's choice of us, his pursuit of us, uh, it, I just, we just need to think about it more, I think, because it will have this impact. One guy just said, where did compassion and kindness come from? From knowing that we are chosen by God, set apart by God, and loved by God. I mean, if we really dwelt on these incredible truths, it would produce compassion, kindness, humility in us if we, if we were soaking on, on these truths. That's why I love adoption stories. Uh, the one I've shared in Sunday school was the one from Ethiopia, this little girl, she was an orphan, had like this horrible situation, and this couple that just went at great cost to themselves, they went to pursue this little girl, and they, this was their girl, and they crossed the ocean to get her, but it's like, we were far worse than that little girl, like we were running our hellbound race, and, the, and God came after us in that condition, and it's just a, it's a melting love that I th really think we just need to make the practice of thinking about it more consistently, because it will produce in us compassion, arts, and kindness, but I mean, how often do we think about God's love for us, God's choice of us, God's adoption, and it it will transform us. If we and the adoptee doesn't ever choose the adopter. I don't know if those are words. But that's the one that goes to adopt chooses who they're going to get. And that's what God did. And why us? He just loved us. And so what can our response be? It has to be this. It has to be. What could our response be but what he's commanded us to do here. And these five words, Mark, would you, I, I find these next words here, the, the um, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience. Yeah, so in Colossians 3.12, let me just read the verse, you just read it, let me read it one more time. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. There's a lot going on in this brief verse, but here's one thing I am sure is going on. Understanding the doctrine of God's election or God's choice of us must create kindness and humility in the way that we live. And if my understanding of the doctrine of God choosing me creates pride and not humility, I am misunderstanding something. So in Paul's mind, election leads directly to humility. How could it not if we understood it correctly? Mm -hmm. I was an orphan in rebellion, lost in the slums of the sins of this world, and God came down and he chose me because he loves me and pulled me out at great cost to his son's life, pulled me out of the orphanage, cleaned me up, adopted me into his family, gave me the family name. I'm now named by Christ. I'm a Christian. And now I have eternal riches heading in front of me. I mean, it's like everything that's not infinite gets boring. Everything that's not infinite gets boring. It, it wears out. It gets old. It gets, it gets uninteresting after a while. These things are infinities. That God would choose me in my sin is an infinite act of grace. That God would give me all things in Christ is infinite. It can't get boring. And if I get bored by it, which I do, it's, it's, it's my problem, not its problem, right? And the reality is uh, astonishing whether I see it or not every day of, of my life. But the, the issue is my eyes get calloused and blind. But the, the reality is infinite. And the Grand Canyon is, is finite. It eventually would get boring. It would, you'd eventually run out of all the facets and you'd see everything there was to see at some point. But what God has done in Christ has no limit. It has no end. It is endless in its ability to astonish us. And it should lead immediately to compassion in our heart, kindness in our demeanor, humility in how we think of ourselves, a meekness and a patience towards others because of how God has so graciously treated us without us deserving it. Why do you think 
oftentimes those who love the sovereignty of God have an arrogance. We, I think we struggle with that. Why is that? Or how? Uh, and, and maybe it's just what you said, that we don't really understand it very well. Or we don't camp on it very well. But there can be an arrogance that, well, we know something more than somebody else knows. Or, I don't know, Scott, I wonder what. Because I think, I'm a, I hate to think about it, but I think it's true. Yeah, I think, see if this makes sense. There's a difference between having a conceptual understanding of a complex idea and seeing it as fascinating and interesting. And if, if you get insight on a fascinating idea that someone else doesn't yet have, you could be tempted to feel superior because I know something this person doesn't know, and yeah. it's very complex, and it's very interesting. You could explain it. It's all fascinating. But until it actually sinks into our heart, away just from an intellectual pursuit, and it really grips us in our affections, we're probably going to be self-righteous in the way we handle any doctrine, right? You figure out the doctrine of the Trinity, and you go, oh, well, I'm going to go beat up on people who don't believe that. Well, that's not the way to handle that. The Trinity should be something we understand mentally to whatever degree we can, but then it should sink down that God is an eternal relationship of love with His Son by His Spirit, and that that should start to have an affecting uh, a result on us. So until the penny drops down and it really gets into mm-hmm. our affections, uh, it, it hasn't gone where it needs to really go. Yeah, that, uh, that's got to be it. Because once it sinks down there, yeah, we need to get out of the what people have called the cage stage before where we're just going around and beating people up with this new doctrine that now we know, you know, but not you know, handle it with a humility. Scott, any other thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, it goes back to the illustration that I, I tried to use last, last time from D. James Kennedy about the, the robbers, the guys wanting to rob the bank. He's trying to convince them not to, and then they take yeah. off, and he runs after them. He's able to tackle one of them, subdue him, and then they all end up Getting, going to the electric chair because they, they killed the police officer and in the process of a made-up story, but it's like we are the criminals. Like, how could we say there's anything in us? We, our heart was in the crime. We, want, we loved our sin, and God pursued us. I think when you get that basic truth down, uh, how could there be pride at all? I mean, I, I love the song, All Glory Be to Christ, because I feel like before my conversion, it was all about myself, but now it's just like everything in me wants to say, All glory to Christ. He's the one who saved me. It's all in Him. That's why I love, and we'll get into the music part too, but I just think singing those truths can help us put, push them down too. Let me just say, an opposite problem would be, if I believe the reason God chose me is ultimately because of something He saw in me first, well, then doctrinally, at the end of the day, why did God choose me? Because of something good in me. Whether it was a future good decision He thought I would make or some future act He saw I would do, if that's the basis of His choice of me, well, then the ground for His choosing is within me. It's not within His sovereign will. He doesn't just say, I loved you because I loved you. It's, I loved you because I knew you were going to X, Y, or Z. And, and that ultimately leaves the ball in our court a little bit. And so Paul is eliminating that and saying, no, it ultimately rests in God's sheer pleasure, His undeserved delight and love for His people. And that is what ultimately should be the, the most incredibly humbling thing to think about. Yeah, we need to really be careful, don't we, to never try, to, never ever to take any credit for that. Or never to believe at all and put those thoughts to, to bed in a hurry if we ever get the idea that, man, I, I'm really pretty good here. I'll bet you it was something in me that, that God saw. That's just so contrary to what, what he's teaching. How about the forgiveness part? That really good here too with the, he goes on with the forgiveness. Bearing with one another If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. It seems like it just goes on with what you're just saying. Any new thoughts there? I mean, I can talk about the the forgiveness aspect. I mean, I can't help but think about this verse. I think about Corrie ten Boom. I've, I've told her story, but just two quick stories. The first, I'll just quote Sinclair Ferguson, who said, the fact that Christ has died for us and brought us forgiveness is the foundation, the motivation, and the model for our forgiveness of others. And, and, and Corey Tin Boom, I've mentioned her many times, written the famous book, The Hiding Place. They were a Christian family. They hid Jews in Holland. They, the house is still there. You can, we watched, my wife and I watched a documentary on this. You can, you can see the house. You can see the spot where they hid the Jews. And then someone basically set them up, betrayed them. And uh, they were all, their whole family was sent to uh, prison camps. She, she was in her 50s. Her sister was in her 50s. Her dad died in a prison camp. Corey's sister, Betsy, an incredibly godly woman uh, who died in this horrible place, Ravensbrook. And then Corey was released clerical error. Was, she was released, and then the war finished, and she went around, and she was traveling around telling the gospel, basically, and telling her story. And uh, she was speaking, so I think it was in Germany, I think she was speaking, and uh, she was talking about forgiveness that we have in Christ, and there was a guy who was a guard in Ravensbrook was there, 
and she, she didn't see him until the, the end of it. Everyone's leaving except for this guard is coming forward, and she immediately recognized him, realized this is the guy that, you know, I had a walk in shame naked in front of this man. And he, he said he'd been converted to Christ. And it was great hearing about the gospel. But he said, you know, I wanted to hear from you. Do you forgive me? And he put his hand out to shake her hand. And she just said, like, she started fumbling in her purse. She's like, I, I can't do this. Like, but she's like, but I, I'm like a hypocrite. I've talked about God's forgiveness. Uh, so she was wrestling. So she just started to pray. She said, Lord, to help me. She said, you know, I could do the action. I could say I forgive you. I could put my arm out there. But she said, would you please provide the, the, the feeling? And so she reached her heart, arm out there and she said it, start, like, it was like a shock. It started in her shoulder, went down. And then as they shook hands, at, like this, this special uh, moment in their hands, she said, this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with, with all my heart. I mean, it's, just, it's the gospel that, that does that. I mean, how could she, she do that? But one, one other quick story on this comes from uh, Chad and Emily Keeter. We, y'all, y'all probably know, some of y'all know that they have two kids, uh, Caleb and Rosie, and we saw them in January, and they came to our house. We had a meal with them. After the meal, kids were playing, and uh, Caleb dumped out all the toys, and there was this little, it's like an arts and crafts little ball that Liliana had, and uh, he's throwing this thing around everywhere where Rosie's crawling around. And I'm like the safety person. I'm thinking... I'm afraid she's going to get it and try to like eat this thing. So I just said something about it. So Emily was like, yeah, he probably shouldn't have it. She takes it away. Caleb thought it's the end of the world. Like he, this is the, his new thing that he just got. He just lost his, his mind. And so then Chad is like trying to calm him down and he's just not calming down. So he's got to take him to the kitchen. He's got to, to, to do some discipline in the kitchen. He's disciplining him and he's like, are you ready to go back? He's like, no, he wants the ball. Like, it was like five minutes long where he's had to like spank him repeatedly. And then finally he, he's ready to go in and they're coming in. And one of the sweetest moments the whole night, Caleb said to his dad, he said, Dad, do you forgive me? And, and, and I'm sure Chad was just joyful to give forgiveness. I used to feel like that should be our response. We should want to. There should be a joy inside of us. We get to model this gospel where we, we can. I mean, that should be the attitude. We, we, we get to. <clears throat> and it goes back to what you told us, Mark. If God's chosen us, if we're holy and set apart because of him, that he set us there, and if we have that kind of love that he has showered on us, I have wronged him so much more, thousands of times more than anybody's ever wronged me. How can I not forgive someone that for whatever they've done? And I know some of you have been wronged deeply. There's no doubt about that. But not ever in the way that we have wronged the Lord. Because he's holy. When we sin, it's one sinner against another sinner. But when we sin against the holy God and he chooses to forgive us, that's a whole different level. And I I don't think there's ever an excuse for a true believer to not forgive. I don't think there's a category for that. That's not an option for us. So I guess I would challenge you if there's someone that right now, you're like, man, I don't know if I can really forgive them very well. That's a great story about Corey Ten Boom. To say, maybe... Think through that. Pray about that. Ask the Lord for grace. And I think he'll give it to you to do that. That's excellent. Just one more time. Let me read verse 13 again. Bearing with one another. Look at the relational phrases here. Bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. And if you look down at verse 15, it says, we were called in one body. And verse 16, admonishing one another in all wisdom. And back in verse... Nine, do not lie to one another. I mean, this one another language is everywhere in this passage. It just, again, it assumes the body of Christ, how vital it is to be in the body of Christ and to have these relationships where, listen, even in the best of churches with genuine Christians, are we still going to fail and sin against each other in different ways? It is a guarantee. Yes, we are. There are going to be times where we say things that are thoughtless. We say things that are rude. We say things that are, we're just not thinking or we're being impatient. It's going to happen. And when that happens, we've got to be prepared to love covers a multitude of sins. It doesn't mean we ignore, we don't, it doesn't mean we ignore sin or we don't deal with it. But when it comes to just the, the everyday struggles of the, the, the normal Christian life, we just have to face the fact that people are going to forget about something or they're going to, whatever it may be, say something that offends us. And we've got to go back to the gospel as our resources to forgive in that moment. We cannot be like the Gentiles who treat others as they are treated by them. Uh, it is so easy to say, well, that person did this kind act to me, and so I'm going to do this kind act back to them. And it's, it's, a, it's a, I scratch your back, you scratch my back sort of morality. And Jesus says, no, that's what pagans do. They lend to those who give back to them, and they don't lend to those who don't pay back. But not so with you. You know, give your tunic and your cloak and turn the other cheek and those kinds of things. So I, I think the idea here being Jesus has to be the supply uh, that, that, that fuels our, our love for each other, not 
measuring how we're being loved in any moment being the standard that we use to love back. Yeah, that's good. I love back scratches. 15 to 17 <laughs> are, this, these are the greatest, but we have 14 here yet. Scott, would you read 14? Because we, it would, we would be way wrong to go through this one too quickly. Yeah. And above all these put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Which one guy just said, he pictures like you put on all these winter clothing and he said you put on this big jacket and it sort of tie it all together. He says, that's like love. Love should be the one that ties everything together. You put it on the end. And it reminded me of 1 Corinthians 13, which is like, is our serving, is our, our words, is it infused and undergirded with love for, for, for other people? And I think of John Newton, who was uh, a pastor. He just said he could tell his people pretty much anything, no matter, even if it was a harsh word, he said, because I, my people know that I love them. I just think, do people know that we genuinely love them, care for them? Uh, it's just a challenging, a challenging thing. Yeah, but I think this love should be infused and undergirded. Everything that we do should have this love sort of binding like a big winter coat. Everything yeah, that's good, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm almost repeating something, but just if, I'm just going to kind of skim through 13 and 14 again. Listen to the kinds of things he's saying. Bear with one another. That deals with annoyances. Yeah. If anyone has a complaint against another, that deals with things that bother you. Forgive each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, you must also forgive. This is within the body of Christ. Verse 14, and above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. The idea is there is naturally going to be relational friction even in godly churches with godly people. It's unavoidable. There is going to be a need to bear with complaints and forgive sin and to love and try to move towards harmony when sometimes there's friction. That's not going to be gone until we get to heaven. Until glory, those things will not be completely eradicated. And so all of us have to just do what we can by God's grace to let love cover a multitude of, of, yeah. of smaller be, sins. Be quick to overlook an offense. I love that. That's a great trait in people. Overlook an offense. And I think that's part of forgiving people. We'll, we'll forgive them a lot easier if we're like, well, I free. That passage in Ecclesiastes, you might remember it, where don't think about every word that somebody says, yeah, I might butcher this a little bit, because you know in your heart how many times you've, do you know which one that is? Yeah, it's I'm not going to be able to find it in time. Oh, it's so Basically, good. Basically, like, yeah, when, when yeah, you slander don't. someone, be careful, because they, they, they know stuff that you've done, too, that they could say in response kind of oh, thing. Oh, yeah, and so we need to, I think we need, that, there's a couple verses in Proverbs so good on that. Be quick to overlook an offense, and, and be forgiving. And man, it'll save you a lot, won't it? There won't be... Uh, all of this bitterness and all these things that can then come up if, we, if we're not very forgiving. 15 to 17. These are so good. If, can I read these and then I yeah. want to hear your guys' thoughts. Let the pe- There's three things here. The peace of Christ, the word of Christ, and we do all for the glory of Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you are called in one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another, in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you knew, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What's your thoughts? <laughs> well, the, the word thankfulness appears three times, right? In yep. these, one in each verse, 15, it ends with thankfulness, 16 has it near the end, and 17 near the end. Thankfulness is such a prominent uh, theme running through these texts. And so, again, for Paul, the, remember the wilderness generation in the 40 years. All of them who were, what, over 20 or 21 or so, all of them fell and died in the wilderness with ex- Caleb and Joshua being the exceptions, I suppose. But that generation, they were marked by complaining, right? They were marked by complaining. And the, the sin was, if they would have simply had gratitude for the Red Sea and the Exodus and where they were heading, and simple trust and gratitude in God, they would have spent two years in the wilderness rather than 42, because remember, the 40 years came because the spies were in the land for 40 days, and they came back and said, we can take it, and then the other 10 said, no, we can't, and they doubted God, and they were not thankful, and they weren't trusting, and so God says, okay, punishment, you're staying here. But if they would have simply had gratitude and trust, they would have been in the promised land in less than two years from when they left Egypt. So I think thankfulness is a bigger virtue than we tend to think it is, mm-hmm. and I think it actually gets rid of a lot more vices than we tend to think. Because with gratitude comes uh, the appreciation, love, and affection for God that will actually uh, sh- shore us up against the fight against many different sins. Yeah, and I think if we're struggling with thankfulness, which will kind of show itself in complaining, we'll go through Colossians. What does it take, 14 minutes maybe? Read all four chapters and then call Scott. 
because Scott <laughs> is unbelievable on this. Scott, thankfulness. You've helped us so much. What has given you such a heart to be thankful? Because I, to me, personally, you've been so helpful in this area. Yeah, well, I mean, I've told this, I've told this to get my guy so many times, but it goes back to reading about George Mueller, which I've mentioned him many times, but reading a biography about George Mueller, and it was, the line was simply something like, George Mueller tried to live his life in such a way where he never let any mercy of God go unnoticed. That was the, that was the phrase, and it's just one of those things where you read a sentence like that, it just convicted me to no end. I, just thought, I thought, how many mercies of God have slipped through the cracks of my life? I just, I just thought, that, I just, it's like water just rushing out. I just haven't seen, and it was, that was the moment where things just immediately changed for me, where I just... To, I want to be seeing, I want to be open to seeing God's mercies. And the more you look for his mercies, the more you're, you're just going to see them all over the, where it becomes, it really becomes overwhelming. Like you just see God's goodness all the time. The more you're paying attention to it. I mean, just t- laughter and friends and your kids. And uh, I mean, getting to explain, answer questions with Michael about, I can't even talk about it, like uh, John Bunyan, like Pilgrim's Progress. He's like, where did the burden go? Like what a privilege. But seeing that, as a, like these moments God is giving to us all the time, and how could that not produce gratitude in yeah. us? I mean, we're, we're just missing it. So it goes back to Mueller for me, and uh, it really, something huge shifted in me when, when I was reading that biography. No, love that. The peace of Christ. Let the peace of Christ rule. It's to be the umpire, right? It's to, it's to rule everything in the way we think. And it's objective in the Romans 5 sense, Verse 1, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. So objectively, we're at peace. There's no more hostility. He's taken that away. We're reconciled. And that's fascinating in its own. But then that ushers in this subject of peace. The Philippians 4, 6, and 7 kind of peace. That be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known to God. And then what? Then the peace that surpasses all understanding. And if you know Jesus, you know this peace. You can't explain it. It's subjective. It's based on the objective, I believe. Only when you are at peace with Christ do you have the peace of Christ. And then thirdly, don't you think, that's why we can have peace with each other. Right? And there should be never a time that two believers are not at peace. Mm-hmm. It's with the forgiveness. It's with the love again. And now I think this just piles on. We can have peace with each other because we have peace with God. We have the peace that surpasses all understanding. And now we have peace with each other. Just, I know a lot of people have heard this, but some people probably haven't. Can you give like a 30 second, when, when you broke your neck at 17 in a football oh. accident, for those who don't know what happened, uh, can you talk about the peace experience? There? Yeah, oh no, that was, and I think it's more, I, I guess it had been a while ago, but I think I experienced more of that subjective peace that night than I've ever experienced ever before. And I had the peace of God um, objectively since I'd been a little guy, and that when I broke my neck laying out on the field, there was this huge peace that surpassed all understanding. Couldn't move anything, but there sure was a peace. And there continued to be. Like it didn't end there. It was like God just kept pouring on that kind of everything's going to be, everything's just like I want it to be. And, uh, and that in his sovereignty um, and his grace were so overwhelming at that point that um, that piece was showered on there. And I, I, it is, it's kind of an unforgettable thing just laying on the field and experiencing something that I had never experienced to that degree and probably haven't ever since then, maybe. Wow. But yeah, it was a, it's, it's great. It's something I wouldn't trade for anything, for sure. But the word, the word is to dwell in us. What does that even mean? 16. I mean, one, one pastor just said, uh, basically, let, go beyond superficial, like of the reading of the Scripture, penetrate deeply into the Word, let it marinate, uh, let, marinate in it, soak in it, make it part of yourself. And I think one guy told the illustration that Martin Luther apparently told 
Uh, again, check it with Papa Fred. But uh, Martin Luther said he reads the word sort of like, like an apple tree, getting apples from an apple tree. He comes to the apple tree, he shakes the apple tree, and apples fall down. You, you collect those. He said that's sort of like skimming the surface. Other times he said you climb up in the tree and you, you find the apples you want. You pull those down, digging a little deeper. He said other times you climb and you examine, like the leaves, you examine the apples, you examine the limbs. He said that's like digging deep into the word. Uh, so we, we want to do that. And uh, I, I, we, know, we know this, but I, I've been reading this little book about different Scottish Christians from a guy named Ian Murray. And he talked about this, one of the guys was a guy named Robert Moffat, I think, I don't know how you pronounce his name, but he was a missionary in Africa, South Africa for 54 years. And he, he, it was, it's moving, it's very short, it's like 40 years, each one's 40 or so pages, but he, he took the, the gospel to this uh, Betuana people, I, I'm not even sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but like, he saw like no fruit, like no conversions. And, you, and then it's all of a sudden, it's like God breaks in and it's just like this incredible thing happened. But he, he spent time translating the Bible. And the first book of the Bible he translated was the Gospel of Luke. And this is what it said. It said, never, he said, had such a treasure been brought to the Bekawana people as the translation of the Gospel of Luke, which he was able to give them in 1831. I mean, it, something like that just reminds me. He, they've never had a treasure like this. Here's the Gospel of Luke in their language. It's the greatest treasure they've ever received, 1831. There it is. It's just, I mean, we have the whole Bible. You come back to, to the wonder of it, how we should want to, we should desire it because it's such a gift. And uh, talking to uh, Hank Bailey, I don't want to embarrass Hank, but talking to Hank, like Hank's got a hunger for the Word of God. If you, if you talked to him recently, uh, and I talked to him a few weeks ago after one of these Thursday nights out there back there near Ian, and talking to him, we're talking about Colossians, talking about all kinds of different passages, and he, was say, he said to me, I just want to get home and dive into the Bible. Again, <laughs> yeah, I want to get into it right now. And like, that's the attitude we should all have, just this hunger that just drives you want to want to spend more time in it. Yeah, that's great. What, what about you, Jerry? How, how, how do we uh, practice that? To, to let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly. Yeah, to be at home in. And, and you know, it's convicting to me because of how many times I neglect where I, I have time for, as a teacher, I have more time in the summer, and I neglect racing to the Word. And there's where I need to call Scott to be thankful and Hank to get to the Word. <laughs> and, uh, and just to say, that is where it's at. There's a 100% success rate when I've gone to the Word. I've never, ever been disappointed by going to the Bible. Never. I can never remember it. But boy, have I been disappointed every time I have it. Because there isn't any place like it. That's where we, and it gives us all we need for life and godliness. Right there. So let's not neglect it, ever. Um, oh, someone was telling me. Oh, I know. Um, no, I don't either know. <laughs> but just in that carrying around the Bible, and we probably have it on our phones too, but Zach, it was Zach. You were saying that a couple weeks ago, that Zach just looks for opportunities all day long at work to where, oh, I got 10 minutes here, I can look in the Bible. I love that, Zach. That made such an impact, even though I forgot where I got it. But it just he, made He's such referring an to impact. Zach Gordon. Uh, I am 17 Zachs right in this area of the yeah, room. Yeah, there are 17 Zach Zachs, Gordon. yeah. <laughs> but Zach Gordon was very instrumental to me to say he looked for opportunities to, to soak his mind in the Word so that the Word would be at home in him. And... Um, and I didn't forget that in that I haven't done that and convicted about that. And just to embarrass Zach, Zach you can hide your face in just a second. But I mean, he's been able to give out some Bibles to people he works with. Yes. And, and I, one guy, I think, was in particular reading the Bible that he'd given him. So just amazing to be able to draw people into that uh, with you. Yep. And, and, and there isn't anything like it. And, you, and we hearing Zach talk about it was very convincing uh, at that table the other night. So 17. Mark, can you help us with that one? Well, I think Ian's going to get mad if I don't say something about the end of, chapter, of verse 16. Oh, let, me, let me say something about the end of 16. Yep. Uh, let, me, let me just read the whole of 16 here. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thanksgiving in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, I, I've said this several times, so repeating this, but... Uh, Tyler Williams bought me a hymn book, uh, Hymns of Grace, and when he gave it to me, I was excited about it, but I wasn't like, you know, overly excited. I thought it's a hymn book. I mean, I don't really, I'm not going to sit around singing. I would sound, it would scare the family. But uh, so I, I have this hymn book up, upstairs in my, in my room where I have my quiet times and whatnot, and I'm, I'm up there, and I, I start picking it up at random points over the last year, and I start just flipping, I'm reading different hymns, and now it gets to the point where, I don't read it every day, but every week, certainly, and I have like a little bookmark, and I just read, I, just, I don't even sing them. 
It would scare the neighbors. I just, I just read them, and I, I just read hymns, and I, I, you know, if there's something I'm not really, I just skip one, but, you know, I, I've been reading them, and it has been shockingly rewarding spiritually. I mean, I, I have been moved by the gospel over and over and over just reading these rich, you got, you got, uh, uh, Isaac Watts and whoever, these incre- the Wesley brothers, these incredible hymns that they've written, and as you read through them, it is a stirring thing. I, I can't believe I'm saying this. I would have never thought about this, but I highly recommend a hymn book to have at your house. You say, we've never, what in the world? Do it. Get a hymn book if you don't have one and use it in your quiet time. I think some of you are nodding yes that you may be doing that. It, it was, it, it's awesome. And then you have the lyrics. You can't quite ever become Alistair Begg because no, he happens he to know knows. the lyric to every song ever written, and he could just say yeah. it extemporaneously while he's preaching. Yeah, he has yeah, a weird memory. Yeah, it scares yeah. me. He knows every song he's ever heard, yeah, he whether does. Christian or not. He'll just quote it. So we may not have Alistair Begg's ability to quote every song we've ever heard, yeah. but at least it starts getting into your, into your bloodstream a little bit. And it, it's a great way to get the word into, into that rhythmic way where you can kind of get it deep into your memory. No, that's really good. Wait, can I just do one more on the, on, the, on the hymn? I mentioned this at our table last time, but uh, one of the guys who preached on this text uh, he, he had a morning service and then after I got a later service, and he said, between services, a lady came up to him after he preached on this text, especially about verse 16, and she was weeping. And uh, she said when she was a little girl, she was attending her grandmother's funeral, her dad's mom's funeral. And uh, she said she looked at her father singing at the funeral for, for her grandmother, his, his mother, as they buried uh, his, the, his dad's, her dad's mom. And she said this, by the look in his face, I knew heaven was real. Like he, she did just watching him sing after she, after his mother had died. He, she knows heaven is real. And then the pastor said, "What is this father doing to his daughter?" He was teaching her in the singing of praise. She saw in him faith and rest and conviction and hope as he sang praises to God. And her heart was stirred and moved, and she's never forgotten it. I mean, there's 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 power when the people of God sing. And I, we talked about it at some at our table. I mean, Doc, Dr. Webster when he sings, like Ian has said, you feel it in your gut. Like when he sings, it's a moving thing. I remember. Uh, like my grandfather was a missionary in Africa, did not have the best voice, but I remember it was later <laughs> in his life, uh, I got to sit beside him, if, if my memory is right, at, at Faith Press. My dad's preaching, my mom was in the choir. I don't remember if, any, if you guys were with me or not, but I remember I was sitting next to him, granddaddy, and like he sang with joy. He was off key and everything else, but he was singing out with joy. Uh, it's a moving thing. Like he means what, he, what he's singing, even though he's not, he's not right on. He's sing, making a joyful noise to the Lord. And I think of just yeah. different people that I grew up singing the gospel just I remember one guy just booming out gospel lines, just at the top of his lungs. And it, it makes, it's just a powerful thing with, with the people of God singing with them. It makes an impression on a child and certainly uh, as you get older. The, the, Scott and I remember a particular person in, in, my, in my dad's church back in the day who w- every time in Christ alone was sung, the last line, no, no power, power of hell, hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns and calls us home. The, the way he sung that line every single time was so full of like passion that uh, it's, it's, it's permanently in our memory. It's just, it's there, you know, it, which is a, it's an encouraging thing. No, that's great. Wow. Well, let's read these, uh, these last few, well, the rules for the Christian household, and then um, we'll get into them for a little bit. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Mark, you want to um, start us on these? Yeah, I mean, uh, so just real quick here on this, and we'll have to come back to this, I'm sure, next yep. week to finish this, but uh, with, with the roles of husband and wife, you remember in, Gen- in fact, just turn real quick to Genesis chapter 3, just to see this. I think it's worth looking at. Clearly, gender roles are not part of the fall. Gender roles are in the Garden of Eden before the fall, but they become distorted in the fall. Do you, does everybody understand that? So Adam was created first, which Paul points out is, a, is, a, is, is significant theologically. Uh, Adam names Eve both Eve and woman, which, which shows something of their relationship. God creates Eve from Adam. Adam is the one given the instructions first privately, and then he's instructed, no doubt, to give it to Eve. Uh, when the fall happens, although Eve is the one who actually ate the fruit in the moment, God calls Adam to account first as an individual. Why? Because of his role as head of the home. His role is primary one responsible for the marriage. He, God has that, that role of responsibility for the husband. That's before the fall. All that is there. But Genesis 3.16 tells us how the fall distorts gender roles, especially in marriage. Uh, look at verse uh, Genesis 3.16. To the woman, God said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, and then your desire shall be for or contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Don't want to get into this for a long time, but I think 
Well, I'll get into it a little bit. Okay, so the phrase there, your desire shall be for or contrary to your husband, that phrase is only used one other time in the entire Pentateuch. Okay, the first five books of the Bible. Only used one other time. It's in the very next chapter, uh, in chapter 4, when it says that sin's desire is for Cain. Same exact Hebrew phrase. Sin's desire is for you, against you, but you must rule over it. You hear how similar that is? The woman's desire will be for or against her husband, and he is going to be lording it over her. If we take the sin analogy, it sheds light on the problem. So in the sin analogy, sin doesn't want to help Cain. Sin's desire is to, dis- to devour Cain like a crouching animal, okay? So sin- sin's desire is to-, is to conquer Cain. It's a bad desire. Cain is called to rule over or to master or destroy the sin, right? Now, if you bring that idea back to Genesis 3, you see the fall and what it does to every marriage. In marriages, the wife will want to, her desire will be for her husband. She will want to be the one taking over the headship of the family. That will be a common temptation throughout human history. And the husband will be tempted to be domineering in the way that he treats his wife. He will lord it over her. So the the fall did not create gender roles. God called husbands to be loving, sacrificial heads of their homes and for wives to submit to and follow the leadership of their husbands. That's from Adam and Eve before the fall. And that's what Christ models in the gospel. But what the fall did was it, it, it made gender roles much more difficult because suddenly we don't want to stay in our lane. We don't want to play the role God has given us. Husbands want to be harsh and domineering toward their wives at times, and that's been happened many times throughout history, and wives will want to usurp the authority of their husbands or to take over the authority of their husbands. And I think that's what Colossians 3 is exactly responding to. So let's go back to Colossians 3. Paul boils marriage down to two sentences. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, he says a lot more in Ephesians 5, and 1 Peter says a lot more in 1 Peter 3. But look at how these correspond to Genesis 3. Colossians 3.18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. That's the opposite of desiring contrary to his leadership. Verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. That corresponds with husbands are going to be tempted to lord over their wives. So here again, the, the Let's undermine the fall. Let's work against the fall. Keep gender roles in place, but let's play our part as God would have us to do. Thoughts on that? Scott? Well, I just think getting in, or barely getting into it, but 18 and on, it's like this is where the rubber meets the road, is yep. what some people were saying. Like, uh, I, think, I think it was, it was Derek Thomas who said the measure of our spiritual, spiritual maturity is not what we pretend in front of others, like not what we are publicly. Everybody, somebody you can put on a face. He says it's what you are like in your home. Like this is where... I mean, this is where people are going to really see you as you are. And like, this is going to be evidence. Has the gospel really transformed you? You're going to see it uh, in the home. And I just think it's been, it's been really convicting, these passages. I'm thinking about the husband part. One guy, this is for husbands in the room, but if you don't have kids, this, this, I'm, I'm pulling this from another guy. He just said, could your, your children go to a, a neighbor or a friend or somebody they meet, and could they tell them, do you want to see a picture of how Jesus loved the church? Come into my home and see my dad love my mom. I mean, that is so convicting, and yet that is just how we are to be as husbands. Uh, can our children go and say, you want to see how Christ loved the church? Come to my house, watch my dad, love my mom. I mean, you see the high calling. For me, it's just been like driving me to my knees, this passage. I, yeah. Mm. It's such yeah. a, I mean, but then it goes back to gospel. Like, we need gospel here, and I mean, we're just barely getting into it, but it is a convicting passage to really soak in, like, our calling, wives or husbands. Yeah. I cannot improve on that, but let, let me just say something because of the culture that we live in. I just feel like this is important to say. Let's just take a moment to do this uh, in the last few minutes, minutes we have. Turn to Galatians chapter 3, just to, to, the book, to your left a little bit. Galatians chapter 3. I'm just dealing with a cultural response to what we're saying that I don't think is correct, but I want to try to give a reason why I don't agree with it. I'm sure we, we, we know this verse. Uh, look, at, look at Galatians 3 uh, verse... 27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. Okay, hear me out on this. Again, dealing with a culturally tense issue. There are a lot of people today, and it's getting louder and louder, who want to use Galatians 3.28 to argue that gender roles no longer exist in the Christian life because there is neither male nor female in Christ. Now, you're going to hear this, okay? Even if you don't believe this personally, you are going to hear this, and you're going to deal with this because, I mean, just on Twitter, I think Zach was talking about uh, there was a post of of a female pastor using that verse to justify being a female pastor. So it's like, okay, how do we respond to that? Okay, so there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, we are all one in Christ Jesus. 
I can make an argument from Galatians, but let's go back to Colossians, and I want to, I want to make my point from Colossians. Look again, and you may already notice this, look at Colossians 3.11. Does it not sound similar? It doesn't mention male and female, but see how similar it is. Colossians 3.11. Here in Christ, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Do you hear it's the same idea? That in Christ these distinctions are, are gone in some sense? Then look, skip down to verses 18 and 19. Does that mean gender roles no longer matter in the church? Now, do you see? In Paul's mind, there's no contradiction or conflict between in Christ, you're neither slave nor free. And then he's going to give instructions for how slaves and masters should interact in verses 22 through 4.1. So he's not, saying that, he's not saying that gender distinctions disappear in Christ. He's simply saying that in terms of our position in Christ, men have no advantage over women. Women have no advantage over men. Men are not more justified before God than women, and women are not more justified than men. Men are not more sons of Abraham than women are. Men are not more sons of God than women are. Women are not more the bride of Christ than men are. In Christ, we are completely equal in redemption, completely equal in the fall, completely equal in salvation, justification, and redemption. We're completely equal in all those ways of salvation. But that doesn't change the fact that, we are still, that men are still men and women are still women, and we have unique callings that match our sex and gender. That's just the way God has made us. It's not a bad thing. It is a good thing, and that's being restored in Christ. And so please don't let anyone tell you that there's no male or female in Christ means there are no gender roles in the Christian life or that our, 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 our callings in life are in no way distinguishable, because Paul puts these concepts side by side uh, here in Colossians. Nope, well said. Scott, you pray for us? Sure. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, once again, we're thankful uh, for these nights uh, to be able to gather as a church family and to have food together, have fellowship together, and open your word together. And uh, we're thankful for this wonderful letter of Colossians. Uh, what a packed letter it is. Uh, oh, thank you for the gospel parts in Colossians. Help us to, to marinate on those wonderful truths that you have chosen us. Uh, I pray that we would soak on, on those realities. And that as we think about your choice of us, uh, incredible that that is, that that would produce in us compassionate hearts, kindness, and humility uh, towards others. Help us to be forgiving in light of the gospel. Help us to motivate us out. Help the peace of Christ to, to rule in us, as Jerry talked about, in the three senses that that is. And uh, Father, I, I pray for the wives that they would submit uh, to their husbands out of reverence for Christ. And I pray for us as husbands that we would love our wives uh, sacrificially, humbly, uh, that it would really would be a picture of how Christ loved the church. Give us grace to do that better and better. And I, I pray for these times around the tables. I pray that these conversations would be edifying and fruitful, give us wisdom and as we discuss these things. And once again, we're thankful for these nights, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.